gigantic carbon arc furnace. You have three electrodes, one foot diameter, uh, 60 kilograms of current, and about 150 volts. It's total about uh, several megawatts. And right here, the arc is struck between the, the carbon rods and the floor of the heart, which is also carbon. But note that the current uses three-phase AC, and therefore you have alternating magnetic field oscillating, rotating, all kinds of things at a temperature of 2000 degrees. So, at the top, basically the raw material he feeds is silicon dioxide, basically quartz and charcoal, wood charcoal, and since he's making ferro silicon, he has a third place where he puts in scrap iron. The three of them are weighed in exact quantities and put it there, and this is a continuous round-the-clock furnace which goes on for weeks together. And at the bottom, he draws out ferro-silicon metal. Now, the observation of relevance to us is that during a 11 week long non stop run in 1995, he had used silicon, uh, 33 tons of silicon. Now, we're not talking about the production per day. 33 tons, tons of silicon fed in the form of silicon dioxide, which contains 15 tons of silicon, 5 tons of iron and one would expect 20 tons of ferro-silicon alloy of 75% uh, silicon. But the actual production of the alloy was 24 tons daily, round the clock for a period of 11 weeks. And there was every day he was producing 4 tons of excess metal literally out of thin air. Basically I should say carbon and oxygen. So he was very puzzled. He knew nothing about cold fusion or anything. And eventually, after talking to various people, he was asked to come and meet me. And we became good friends. And I immediately recognized that what is happening here is exactly what is happening in the carbon arc experiment, which is well known in the field. And I was very happy to do it. The person number five today by our Hungarian friend, Avery, exactly as in the same thing. He has taken carbon powder and he has put it in a quartz, exactly like this. And he has put it in a microwave oven. And this is a gigantic furnace. But I, when I presented the same thing at the, at the, uh, uh, in the China meeting, I was puzzled as to what happened to the energy. How can you have transmutation without the release of energy? And this was the puzzle which prevented me from even talking about this for the past 15 years. I was aware of it for 15 years. I didn't have the guts to come out in the open because I know it will be shut down. But because Mora and others in this center are very interested in, in, in transportation. I decided we we'll submitted as a post deadline paper and I thank and thankful to Iwa Mora for giving me an opportunity to present this. But then having come here, I have learned something new that I need not worry about the excess, the missing excess energy. And there are several people in this uh, group who have persuaded me that there are many paths possible where you can have simultaneously exothermic and endothermic uh, nuclear reaction which can sort of cancel the excess heat. So other, uh, 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 Dr. Sudinsky just spoke about it and there have been others. So more on the poster.